welcome all of you to the service of worship at the Congregational Church of Brookfield. We want to assure you that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here with us today. I also want to um, express my thanks to Janine Hanowitz, who gave these beautiful flowers in memory of her parents, but also to um, Carolyn Lindroth, who brought this little side flowers in memory of her brother, Robert Carpenter. So. Um, that's, um, it's wonderful to have flowers here. The other thing that I is a joy to say is that we hope to install our new audiovisual system this coming week. Yay! The office is closed on Monday and we have a short week to get it done. So I invite your prayers that it gets done by Pentecost. So. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> That sounds good, that sounds good. Yes, prayers for dear husband and our marriage in this coming week, okay. So, yes, his in-laws arrived, a special anointing of the spirit. And the dryer broke and the oven broke, anything else? Oh, his computer broke. Other than that, he's having a great week, okay. Well then, let us center our hearts and minds in some silent prayer as we listen to the tolling of our church bell and prepare for worship. Please join me now in our responsive call to worship that you'll see in your bulletin. Let us be joyful before God. Let us be jubilant with joy. Let us sing to our creator, sing praises to God's holy name. Lift up your songs to the Holy One who rides upon the clouds. Let us give thanks to the Lord who provides for us, who daily bears us up. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth, sing praises to the Lord. Awesome is God, who gives us power and strength. Blessed be God.
Please join me in our unison prayer of approach in the Lord's Prayer. Thank you, Holy One, for your steadfast love and protection. You give the homeless a home. You lead prisoners out to prosperity. You nourish the parched land with life-giving rain. We are grateful to you, O God, for a powerful and enduring faith heritage. We are grateful that in your goodness you have provided for us your beloved flock. We are grateful that you still are at our side, walking with us through every dark valley. You are the God of our salvation. You shatter our fear and our guilt. You bring us back from the depths as you call us to dance and sing before you. Strengthen our voices for praise as we come to worship and save you. Who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated, and I'd like to invite the children to come and sit here um, with Mrs. Quinsland, who has a story to share with you. Today, there's going to be a big parade. Do you know why? It's why? Memorial Day. You got it. It's Memorial Day. So the reason we celebrate Memorial Day, actually, it's on May 31st is the proper day, but we celebrate it on a weekend these days because that's what the, that's what those in charge said we we're going to do. Never have figured that one out. But anyway, it's basically a day to remember all the soldiers and the sailors and the airmen and the Marines and the Coast Guardsmen who have protected this country. They've protected this country for so many years so that we can do what we're doing today. We can come here and worship the way we want to, among other things. These are people who've died, men and women both, who've died. But every Memorial Day, we also remember others in our church. And we do it through this thing. And it's called the Book of Remembrance. And I know a lot of you have probably heard of the Book of Remembrance, but you've never seen it. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that pretty? Yeah. So in the Book of Remembrance, we get a chance to remember people who have been really important to us over the years and who have died. For example, my brother's name is in here, and my cousin, and a very dear friend of Mr. Me Mr. Quenzen and I. So their names are inscribed in here. Now, I called Mrs. Sochi last night, and I said, Mrs. Sochi, when did the Book of Remembrance start, do you know? She said, wow, I don't know, I'm going to have to go look. She did. She said, this book is the third volume. So there are two other volumes. And she said, well, it started in 1954. I said, oh, OK. I said, do you have any idea how many names are inscribed in all of the volumes? Of and so we did some, some math, and we figured out that there are well over 3,000 names that have been remembered in our Book of Remembrance over the years. Um, the counting, the, it's actually numbered now, and the counting didn't start until 1969. So all that time, they were putting book, the names in, but not counting them. So we kind of had to guess a little bit, but we figured there are well over 3,000 names in here, all of people that have died that are important to us. So remember that Memorial Day is about the soldiers and the sailors and the airmen and the Marines and the Coast Guardsmen, 
but it's also about all those that we've lost. Grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles, cousins. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's have a little prayer. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us to be grateful for those who have gone before, for those who have kept our freedoms, and for those who have kept this as a place where we can come and worship freely. And we praise this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I guess you guys can go off now. If you want to take a look, look only with your eyes, not with your hands, okay? Let us pray. As we listen today, Lord, guide our thoughts and open our hearts to know your voice still speaking to us today. As we struggle to understand your ways and discern your wisdom, grant us the courage we need to build up your kingdom of love and bear witness to the presence of your risen Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture lesson today is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1 verses 3 and 6 through 11. After his suffering, Jesus presented himself alive to them, appearing during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? 
This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Our second New Testament reading today is changed from what's printed in the bulletin. This is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of our sins. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold peace of grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. May God bless to our understanding this reading from the Holy Word. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our minds and hearts as we gather together to worship you today, may it all be acceptable and even pleasing to you, for you are our strength and our salvation. Amen. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter season. It is Ascension Sunday. We remember the ascension of Jesus after these 40 days of Easter season where he was known to appear and to walk among the disciples. Um, he appeared during 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. But he was part-time Jesus in this Easter season. He, there were several, as you remember, from the Road to Emmaus story, you know, stories of his comings and goings. And so we can understand how frustrating it must have been for the disciples at that moment of the ascension, where the scripture says he, they saw him rise up to heaven before their very eyes, and while they were looking up at the clouds, two men came and stood beside them and said, why are you looking up? Why wouldn't they be looking up? And yet, the two men in white, the angels seem to come in pairs like this. They did this earlier in the Easter stories. Their message is one that is still valid for us today, I think. Why do you stand looking up at heaven? He, they're calling, calling Jesus once again to see, they're calling the people of faith to see Jesus on the road, to see him elsewhere, to see him in this life, wherever they go. He makes this promise, after all, that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit came upon them and they will be witnesses all over the world. Well, here's the thing. Were they witnesses to that one thing, this one miraculous event? And are we called to believe because of this one amazing special effects moment that is so, frankly, difficult to believe? I don't think so. I think when Jesus calls them to be witnesses, he's calling them to be witnesses to this stuff he did during the 40 days, speaking and teaching about the kingdom of God. But I am sure that they weren't eager to go on that mission. Here their leader has just been crucified. It is not a good time for them. And yet what I would say is, stop looking up could have been the theme song of the entire gospel 
the entire Christian story, the entire message of Jesus. Jesus calls people to be the people of God there on the road, not just going through the motions of religion, not just gazing up as in Gothic cathedrals at the sky. Jesus walked as many young adults in um, our world today have walked, a, wa a walk of like living their faith out on mission trips in the world. Jesus walked in the tradition of people like the great pop prophet Micah, who 800 years before had said that God was not impressed with people who came into worship all dressed up in their fancy clothes with fat wallets to open up their um, riches and be seen in public as how important and wonderful they were. I'm sorry, this is not a good stewardship message, but <laughs> Micah says instead, um, it's not about your offerings. Micah asks the question, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil? No. Micah says, what does the Lord require of you but choir to do justice? love kindness and walk humbly with your God. It's so important there's a song about it. This is the mission. This is what we're called to bear witness to. And the work that we do here in the meeting house is just like your trip to the gym. You know, it's to strengthen our faith so that we're ready to go out and do what needs to be done. Because even today, this is hard work dangerous work, work of proclaiming a different way, a way of freedom, a way of respect for individuals that many people in uniform have given their lives to protect this way, this way that says no to tyrants, to rulers who, who rule dictatorships and with an iron fist who take freedom away. This is an allusion even to Elijah, the great prophet Elijah from the chariots of fire prof, um, passage. You may remember Elijah is the other one who is taken fully up into heaven in a chariot of fire. It's dramatic, it's exciting. But remember Elijah's mission? Elijah took a stand against white collar crime. He took a stand against the mighty King Ahab who was a real estate tycoon who took over the vineyard of his little neighbor, Naboth. And this was an abomination before the Lord to take away from the poor and give to the rich. And Elijah was not popular when he stood up to the king with that message. He was run out of town. His life was threatened. And blessed Elisha follows behind his disciple and what witnesses this amazing scene of Elijah taken bodily to heaven and he receives his mantle with the promise that he will carry on that mission. Jesus knew this was a story he was repeating. He was seen to be the next Elijah. And so this is the tradition of active, loving, justice-seeking faith that we're still called to bear witness to. This is the prophetic message that we are still called to preach. We are not called to a weak, sentimental, heaven-gazing faith that just happens inside a building. We are called to follow the marching orders of our leader and to stand up to defend God's law of love, the love of God and neighbor, the love of God that Jesus says, is shown not by what you say or the offerings that you bring, but what you do for one another, the love that you show for one another, the welcome that you extend to a stranger, the way you take care of your sick, the way you feed your hungry, the way you look after those who are in prison, sharing with the least of these, my brothers and sisters, which Jesus calls us to do in Matthew 25. This is what we are called to bear witness to, not to a baby in a manger, a cross on a hill, an empty tomb, and a stairway to heaven. 
there's a whole lot that Jesus teaches in between about thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. But why us? I, I don't know about you, but I can identify with the disciples when they say, but Jesus, can't you just come back down and do it? You know, Jesus, you did it so well. You're a powerful public speaker. People are willing to follow you. I mean, he can even walk on water. What can I do? A mere private in God's army. But Jesus, more important, I think, than us believing in him, he believed in us. He believed in us to carry on. So this is why I took this passage from 1 Peter. We've been hearing from 1 Peter for weeks now, and there's this wonderful passage that uh, Walt read today that I think helps to tell us how we are to do it. Like, we get that we're supposed to do it, but some days I don't feel like getting out of bed, much less turning on the news. So, here's what he says. Peter says, the end of these things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Ooh, that's rough. I do love to complain. Be good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Isn't that a great phrase? We are stewards of the manifold grace of God. We are taking care of that idea and sharing it with the world. Serve one another with whatever gift you have received. And this, this is the God is still speaking line. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. What kindness we would be showing one another if instead of shouting our opinions at the top of our lungs, we could listen with kindness and with patience, believing that our neighbor might have a perspective that we don't yet have. And whoever serves, then, must do so with a strength that God supplies. God does supply strength. I know I've experienced that in my life, and many of us, I think, have also experienced it, perhaps never more so than at times when we, like the disciples, are grieving. When we find ourselves in those stuck places, looking heavenward, just feeling sad. And so it is out of those stuck places that the angels call us to be not afraid and also stop looking up, to come along and believe that God will provide the strength to meet the challenges that lie before each one of us. I wanted to share with you um, a reference to a movie I saw recently, Hacksaw Ridge. I'm not terribly a big fan of Mel Gibson, nor war movies, but I thought the story of Desmond Doss was so amazing. And if you don't know it, it is based on a true story of a soldier from Lynchburg, Virginia. And even though I grew up really close to that area, I had never heard the story before. Did any of you see it? Do you know the movie? So he was a conscientious objector, Desmond Doss. And he went into the army to be a medic, but refused to carry a gun. And some of the movie is about his struggle to make it through the red tape to be able to serve and not be court-martialed. But the amazing thing was, by the end, he is able to save 75 people, his comrades at the Battle of Okinawa, with strength that he did not know he had. The way of Christ, the way of love and peace, is brutally hard, and perhaps never more so than in times of war. It is so much easier, I think, to believe in the holy escalator to heaven or the strong, invincible God of eternal Father, strong to save, who calms the restless wave, than it is to believe that I may be given the power to calm the restless sea 
or that I might be given the power to say a healing word, that I might be called to be a peacemaker in the settings where I find myself. And yet, we do it. Even this church bears witness to the love of Christ being extended from that day in Jerusalem to the end of the world, the end of the earth. We are here. That small band of pilgrims got on their boat and they came here to found a new land where people spoke the truth in love to one another and discerned the way forward together, not under the thumb of tyrants. We are here from Brookfield. We sent out the first missionaries. Our young people went to Hawaii all the way around Patagonia to get there on their mission trip in 1819. And from Brookfield in next month, we send out a missionary of our own, Samantha McPadden, Sam McPadden, who's going off to Africa with our help to build an artist colony in Africa there in Kenya. We do this all the time, every July. This July, we send out our young people to the Boston Rescue Mission again. Our men have been there. Our women have been to Rhode Island. And even our thrift shop is bringing people into us to fund mission that will go out to help refugees that Iris helps resettle. It hardly seems possible, but the people of faith are still getting the job done down in the trenches. Jesus left us alone, but we are not alone. The Holy Spirit's power comes to us when we need it, when we need the wisdom and courage to continue his work for justice and peace and to be witnesses to another way. We are not alone, people of faith. Christ is risen, is with us. Thanks be to God for this good news. Amen. Please join me now in our preparation for prayer. invite uh, Doug Fisher, our deacon, to join me up here as we begin our Book of Remembrance um, ceremony. We, each spring at Memorial Day weekend and each fall on the Sunday closest to All Saints Day, we remember and honor those saints that we have known both in our church and in the, our lives beyond these walls. Those whose names are read today have been remembered over the past half year by donations to our Book of Remembrance Fund, and they are gratefully received to be used at some future time for the good of the church. You'll see in your bulletin that the most recent expenditures you are walking on our carpet and, and our media booth upgrades that will be happening are, are paid for from that. And our extra choir robes that we got for our extra choir members, praise the Lord, that was also funded by some of this. So we are grateful for this time to remember um, and the donations that were received. And on Memorial Day weekend, we particularly want to remember those who gave their lives in service to our country. So as we begin, let us remember these words from the letter to the Hebrews. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Let us remember that God calls us all to be saints, people, of the Holy Spirit, 
bound together with all of those who in every place and every time have called upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pauline Bankus, Richard M. Bass, Daryl Bates. From the book of Job, hear these words. For I know my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth. Henry and Althea Beck, Marion Boughton, Walter Boughton. From Psalm 23, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jane Marie Burgess, Ralph and Marie Chiavelli, Nellie Manuela Silberti. From Psalm 30, O Lord, be our helper. You have turned our mourning into dancing. You have taken off our sackcloth and clothed us with joy so that our souls may praise you and not be silent. O Lord, our God, we will give thanks to you forever. Jill Bates Citron, the Koval family, Peter Kushney. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Tom Aker, Sally Emmerich, Michael Estrella. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus said, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Judith A. Fisher, Marianne H. Gardner, Donna M. Geck. In John's gospel, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Harry Giroux Sr., Joan Gould, Corey Labarelli. In John's gospel, Jesus said, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. Audrey Elise Marshall, Jane and Peter Maxim, Davis A. Palmer. On the last night of his life in John's Gospel, Jesus prayed to the Father saying, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Carol Ann Powers, Victor Ridge, Jeffrey H. Robertson. In his letter to the Romans, Paul wrote, we are now justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Harriet Tarrant Rosenberg, Linda E. Rue, Richard A. Russell. From Paul's letter to the Romans, if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Kenneth Smith, Peter Sochi, Albert Clifton Stewart. From Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, love bears all things, love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never ends. Richard Stewart, Barbara Todd, Stephen and Elizabeth Toth. And a second time Paul wrote to the Corinthians saying, we have this treasure in earthen vessels to show that transcendent power belongs to God and not to us. Barbara Walker, Arthur Wortman. And from the 21st and final chapter of the Revelation to John, God will wipe every tear from our eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. 
for these first things have passed away. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, O Lord our God, for all your servants and witnesses of times past, all the saints and the martyrs in every time and in every land. In your mercy give us, as you gave them, the hope of salvation, the strength we need for the journey, and the promise of eternal life through the firstborn from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, as um, I said, we have, um, as, as we do at this time in our service, we look at the names that are on the back of our prayer list, and I have a few um, additions to offer. We, of course, remember um, in prayer all of our loved ones who have gone before us, and including um, uh, the John and Madeline Hanowitz and Robert Carpenter. Um, we also celebrate Carol Howe. Um, her name was inscribed into the book and we decided that it felt a little off to read her name along with the names of the dead. We were afraid if you weren't paying attention you might be grieving Harold, um, Carol unnecessarily. Um, Carol was honored with a page in the Book of Remembrance for all of her really wonderful work here in our church before her move to New Hampshire with the deacons and the Stephen Ministers and Women's Fellowship and many other places. So um, our, um, our prayers of gratitude are up for Carol. Um, we did get, I did get a report at the first service from Martha Parvis who had visited her up in New Hampshire and gave a good report of her um, her life there and said her dog especially has made her very popular. So. We got some good news that um, Gretlin Riley from the 830 service, her daughter graduated from Boston University last weekend and has a job at a law firm, so we're rejoicing with that. We rejoice with Jennifer that everybody in her family apparently had a birthday and she had an anniversary and she gets to be with them today, so that's a joy. Um, also, joy that John Markowitz is back in the choir after bumping his head, so um, did you stay awake for the sermon? Oh, I'm sure. Okay. All right. Just, just checking, you know, that's what we EMTs want to do, make sure you're still awake. Um, I got, have a couple of kind of sad news. I, one of my favorite professors at Pacific School of Religion, Derwood Foster, passed away at age 91 this last week, and he truly was an influential guy in that area, especially in like Buddhist Christian dialogue and inter um, like civil rights movement. He was uh, really did a lot of stuff um, to bring people together. So um, our prayers are with his family in uh, Berkeley and Oregon. Um, my dear colleague, Davida McAllister, I think I'm supposed to lift this up as a joy, but it's a sadness for me that she's taken um, Molly Basquette's church up in Somerville, Massachusetts, and she is moving on to be a senior pastor there and won't be leading our Connecticut racial justice uh, initiative anymore. Uh, but I am pleased that I can go celebrate her ministry this afternoon in Hartford. Um, and of course, there are, have been terrible terror attacks this last week, so our hearts go out to the people who have been victims. Um, 
For whom else shall we be in prayer? Yes. So Carol and Steve, um, we're praying for them, especially as they care for their parents. They're in a club with many, um, but also uh, joy that our church school created a hopscotch mat, mat for a um, South African preschool. And so Jillian is in touch with them and heard that they received it and they were overjoyed to get our playground equipment. So that's a great joy. Yes. Let us unite our hearts then in a time of prayer. Loving and gracious God, we come before you with sighs too deep for words as we remember people we have loved who have gone before us. We still ask for your help in finding voices for praise. Help us to notice and to lift up all that is good and holy and wonderful, not only in those we have loved who have died, but also in our fellow travelers here in our church and in the world. Knit us together in your covenant of grace and peace, we pray. May we be good stewards of that message of grace. Help us to live out our faith in each day of our lives, especially we pray that you give us the wisdom and courage to speak the truth in love when the way is hard, when there are differences of opinion, and also, we pray, give us the grace to listen with care in the spirit of true peacemakers and in the spirit of Jesus Christ, in whose name we offer this and all our prayers. Amen. So we get to hear from Doug Fisher today, the call to share. Did you forget? OK. You just looked a little dazed and stunned. I just wasn't sure. OK. If you haven't already noticed, You'll be in tag team by Fishers today. <laughs> I love my church because, well, I was up thinking about this for the last couple nights. It's because you have the freedom to think the way you want to. You're able to grasp God and Jesus and believe and do the things you want without being persecuted or being questioned, not like many of the box churches. My wife belongs to a box church. You're able to go to men's fellowship and speak your mind. We won't bring up the stuff we talk about, but you get to go out as a Stevens minister to help people. You get help by Stevens ministers. You get to enjoy yourself in a choir the days that I do show up for choir. Um, you can be involved with the deacons. You can be involved with working with the church fair. How can you beat that? You work in a parking lot with Bob Brown. That's like second to none. <laughs> and soon we're going to be having a nativity program that is going to be second to none in anything in the community. And I might even get the opportunity to work with an alpaca or a goat. <laughs> I know Doug Watson used to have a rooster he used to bring in here. And you got something different. I love this church because in times of good and times of bad, it's like a big family. I think that's what it's all about. One year ago today, we celebrated my mom's service here. We had the big family here, our family and the entire congregation. And I can only thank every one of the people that are here and the members for all the support. That's why I love my church. I live to give to the work and the financial support to my church because without the financial support, we're not able to run all the programs, not the Christian education, different things at Silver Lake, different share programs. So I figure that's, that's well worth it. So the morning, offer, the, 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 the morning offering will now be received.
Let us unite our voices now in our offertory prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you for your church and for the saints who have gone before us, heeding your call to discipleship. Bless these gifts we offer today. May they be a legacy for generations of faithful Christians to come. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with loving kindness and grant you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. And now as we have been so richly blessed by the love and grace and peace of Jesus Christ, let us pass that peace here in this meeting house and especially out in the world. Go in peace.